Hey folks, come on here, come on! At your service. And I've brought along a couple of friends. A couple of fanged friends. You see me today, I'm wearing the McDonald. Oh! oh. <laughs> Could have positioned him a, a bit better, couldn't I? Yeah, so folks, right, we have just seen episode two of The Beeb and Netflix's Dracula 2020, as written by Mark Gattis and Stephen Moffat. Now this instalment was all set aboard the Demeter, another fabulous chapter, a really eerie one in the Bram Stoker original novel. Although it's kind of not really detailed in the book, it's just like the, the ship's journal, the captain's journal. And this poor guy who's found lashed to the wheel and it steers in to the harbour at Whitby. And of course Dracula makes landfall, having slain the entire crew. Well, after the previous night's exciting instalment, episode one, um, which got fabulous reviews, not just by myself, but by, you know, every review I read was glowing with praise for it. Particularly for a Clace Bang, is his name? Clace Bang, Danish actor playing Dracula. Uh, <laughs> who, now that he's got his youthful vigour after draining the, the blood from Jonathan Harker and numerous other people in the first instalment, he now looks just like Robson Green. Hmm. Which is not that threatening when you think about it. Sorry, the lights just dim slightly there and we've got that hazy look across the screen again. This is what plagues me when I do videos of a night time with this inferior camera equipment. It goes all grainy and gets all this, this patina of age and vintage. But then again, maybe it's entirely apt, I don't know. What do you guys think? You ain't saying much. Um, and we're playing now, again because the soundtrack to this particular um, Dracula story is not yet available, but it's going to be available. It's definitely coming out, I think, at the end of January, I think it's coming out uh, in CD and probably um, download as well um, by David Arnold and it's a great soundtrack but I'm now playing John Williams' score to the epic 1979 very elegant stately version of Dracula directed by John Badham which I love and uh, anyway but back to back to this new revamped version shall we say well, where did we start with this? After the cliffhanger at the end of episode one, yes, they're in the convent, the nuns have been slaughtered, Sister Abigail, who is Abigail Van Helsing, is there with Mina, who would have been Mina Harker if things had turned out right. And uh, they're protected by the circle, you know, of, of what is it, uh, the broken bread, you know, the body of Christ. But of course, Jonathan Harker seems to come back in and his old Johnny Blue Eyes, Amina says to him like, but Johnny, what happened to your blue eyes? Because they're black, they're sort of reddish black. Because, and he whispers in her ear, they're not mine. Because it's really, it's Dracula inside the skin and flesh of Jonathan Harker. Great clever little twist. And then kind of left, <gasps> what happens? We find out now that he says to Mina, run, get away but he wants Sister Abigail. Then we find them playing chess. When abouts are they playing chess? Is this before the events that we see or is it after the events that we see? Well, it gets a little bit confusing because he then details to her how he survived his trip across the Atlantic, the Atlantic, yeah, um, on the, the ship, the Demeter. Now, this is where it radically departs from, again, any Bram Stokerisms because Bram Stoker did not detail all that happened on that ship. But they spend an entire 90 minutes aboard that ship. And what they've done in a clever little um, contrivance, they've turned what was a nifty, eerie segment in Stoker's original novel into basically Agatha Christie. It's like death on the Demeter. Only we know who the murderer is. But you've got this elaborate selection, this smorgasbord of uh, juicy suspects. And, you know, you, you various characters, uh, an old uh, duchess from Bavaria. You've got um, a freshly married couple 
with their manservants, but we know that there's something quite awry with this little situation. We have uh, Piotr, who's really, he's nicked the identity of Piotr to go aboard this ship, because Piotr has died and come back as a vampire, and then been staked by Dr. Sharman with his deaf and dumb daughter, who then goes aboard the ship as well. So you've got this elaborate selection of, uh, of passengers and, you know, a motley crew as well. Excuse me one moment while I indulge in the blood of life. Mm. It's just tea, but it's in a blood red cup. Mm. The elaborate um, set for the Demeter is pretty good. Dracula is also on board as Count Dracula. And he so he can walk around all the time, even during the daytime. We see he breathes out the fog <laughs> in, a, in a clever little sort of, you know, little visual aside, but a narrative bit of structuring which does help the story. So this fog stays with the Demeter. Instead of the ship going out of it, the fog stays with it. So it's in this perpetual sort of twilight, this smoky twilight. And we now know that this rendition of Dracula is erudite, he's a trickster, he is a stunning socialite, but he plays games with his victims. He's basically taunting the entire human race because he's so vastly superior. And so he sets about inf infiltrating this weird societal group aboard the ship and uh, getting to know various ones and then chowing down. As I said in the previous uh, review, that it's quite clear now, Sister Abigail has realized why he does what he does. He's learning, because he doesn't just, when he, when he takes the blood of a victim, he isn't just drinking the blood, he's absorbing their knowledge, their skills, their talents, their beliefs. And it's quite a clever little thing. What Gattis and Moffat have done is they are just systematically breaking down every single aspect of the Dracula and vampire mythology and giving it a logical reason as to why these things take place, why they have to happen, how Dracula gains his powers. And Sister Abigail during this chess game where he's recounting, <laughs> recounting how he um, survived this trip and got to England. And she says, yes, you were doing this. You play with your victims and then you absorb all their knowledge because you wanted to find out how to be able to exist and to walk among the society, the high society of England. So you were learning all these tricks, all these foibles that, you know, the nouveau riche have. And it's, it was a it's a clever trick, it's a clever bit of background to this particular characterization, and it definitely works. Clace Bang is having a field day. He is, you know, if you're chewing the scenery, he's chewing the cast as well. And he nibbles down on pretty much everybody on, on board this ship. And, uh, you know, after day one at sea, they've lost two people. Yeah, because, you know, he gets hungry. But of course, you know, the finger begins to point at various suspects. But we know he's just playing games and he's just tormenting them all. And secreted in the hull, he has 50 caskets of air, Transylvanian air. Because we all know that's where he's meant to be sleeping. He can only sleep in his own soil. And, uh, but because of this fog, he can walk around and he can whine and die. Well, hey, you're not eating tonight, Count? Uh, no. Uh, more wine? No, I don't drink wine. Again, his accent is hardly Transylvanian. Uh, however, the rest of the crew have very Eastern European, you know, accents, which are quite amusing. I mean, some of them I presume actually are, but there's a guy there called Clive Russell, I think it is, who's been in loads of things, instantly recognisable. He plays a guy called Valentin, and uh, it's always great to see him. He was great in the, th he played a Viking in the 13th Warrior, and uh, he's been in, I think, Game of Thrones as well. He was in Thor the Dark World. He's in lots and lots of things. He's a great, you know, a sort of, you know, dependable, reliable cast member. Once you see him there, you kind of, we're in safe hands here. And for the most part of this episode, you are indeed in very clever safe hands. 
The script, once again, is very clever, very witty. You know, there's lots of um, verbalised threats and insinuations. There's a fair bit of homoeroticism as well, because the Count will, you know, if it, I view people as wine, white and red. I like all vintages, all flavours, you know. So he'll do anything. He'll have anybody. But of course, it isn't sex. It's just... But he'll do whatever he needs to to get his feast. And he realises that the uh, the married couple, the woman, the, the newly uh, married bride, is a bit sick and won't come out. Of, you know, puff, won't come out of her room. Doesn't like the ship. Doesn't like sea travel. But quite clearly, her husband, her new husband, and their black man servant uh, are the real lovers in this situation. And the count clocks that. He thinks I can move in here. This is how I'm going to do this. So he realises, you know, and he isolates the. Uh, you know, the, the young bridegroom and you know puts his hand on his thigh and clearly he's going to put the bite on this guy but in another quite clever contrivance as to okay why have we got the Demeter now full of very interesting people hmm are they all there just by chance no 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 as if coincidence plays a part in all this they've all been they've all got a connected connection to a guy called uh, Mr Blower and Mr. Blower has recruited various people to be on this ship. Charmin, the, the doctor, who has vampiric experience because he kills Piotre, who then this other guy takes his identity and gets on board the ship. Although I'm not sure why he does that, but he does anyway. And he's a likeable young lad, young scamp. And then um, the Duchess is there and this married couple are set to inherit. They've gone into a huge inheritance. But they have a mysterious business partner called Mr. Blower. Who's Mr. Blower? I hear you say. Kiltman. Who? Who could be Mr. Blower? Well, as Sister Abigail does say, Blower is a uh, Volachian for dragon. And Dracul is dragon. So, it's not a very clever play on words. And Count Dracula is like, well, I, I thought it was quite clever, actually. Uh, because, yes, Mr. Blower is Count Dracula. And he has inveigled all these people... I don't know when he did all this, but he's done it all to be on that, that ship so he can play one up against the other. He can put the bite on them all. He can absorb whatever essences and life traits and knowledge that they have for himself. And plus, because it's married couple and he's the hid, the secret business partner, the sleeping business partner, uh, who only sleeps during the day, obviously. Uh, once he's killed them, he stands to inherit all this, this huge, vast fortune. So when he gets to England, He's going to have a huge fortune waiting for him. Plus, he'll have all the skills, the social skills, to inveigle his way into all his parlour rooms and societal balls and have a great old time in old Blighty. Bloody Blighty. Clever plan, you know. But Sister Abigail is on board the ship as well. Now, this is what gets me. Now, maybe I'm stupid. I probably am. I walk around in a vest and a kilt. Even in the snow and the ice. So, yeah, I'm pretty damn stupid. But, you see Abigail and the Count playing chess. And she begins to get a bit weaker during the, the little interludes from the Demeter storyline. You see them playing chess. And she begins to lose. And she's getting a little bit tired. And how, how did I get here again? All of a sudden, she's losing her faculties. And the Count is there. She goes, you don't drink wine. And he's like quite a thick for wine and she's like that's my blood isn't it how did I get here well how did she get there and exactly where are they are they back in Castle Dracula or are they meant to be in Carfax Abbey in England or not I don't know I think it's the castle to be honest but I'm not entirely sure um, but on the in the cabin as well don't go into cabin number nine the guest in there is ill only the captain can go in there. But as more and more people begin to disappear, and um, obviously there's a mad, there's a murderer on board. Right, Captain, it's time. We must go into that cabin. And of course, in the cabin, there's Dracula! Whoa! Count Dracula, what are you doing here? Well, I thought I'd jump the gun and uh, I'd be first on the scene. And they find all trinkets from the, the, so the, the victims, the ones who've all gone missing. And then he pulls the, uh, you know, the curtains back. And of course, it's Sister Abigail lying there, bedecked in blood. 
She's covered in the blood of their victims. So she takes the blame and they're going to hang her. They're going to hang her from the yard arm, the mast or whatever you call it. And, um, and she actually says, hanging me won't save, won't save you all because I'm really a vampire. And it's all a trick to get Dracula to come a bit closer. So she bites her tongue and spits the blood at him. Remember she taunted him in the first episode at the gates of the, uh, the convent. She cuts her hand and sprinkles the blood, making him ravenous, making him lose his cool. And does the same thing here, which kind of proves to everyone that yes, this guy actually is. He's the real vampire. So it's a nice little trick. And then she assumes command of the ship. <laughs> They make another circle, they make a circle out of the pages of the Bible, and they, they, they hide in there, the last survivors will hide in there. And of course, down below, there's been more trouble in one of the other cabins. Now the doctor's been killed, the businessman who lost his, his wife to Dracula, but the bite's been put on him, and he wants to become what Dracula is, an eternal partner for him, because he fancies Dracula, and he also wants eternal life and the power of a vampire. But the dickhead shoots the doctor because Dracula wanted the, the knowledge of the doctor because as he says, science is the future, you know. <laughs> and uh, But the doctor gets killed and the daughter, the deaf and dumb daughter, takes poison to kill herself. So he can't even have whatever she knew. So enraged, he kills this stupid, you know, bloody aristocratic knobhead and uh, but Pietri, or rather, the, you know, is the alias Pietri. He sees it, he stumbles onto what's happened there, and then staggers onto the deck in shock and comes into the circle. And they're all like, hang on a minute, Pietri, because Sister Abigail knows that he's already hidden inside the body of a wolf and inside the body of Jonathan Harker. So Pietri, we invited you in. Just step outside the circle again just to prove. So we're all thinking, hey, hey, has he done it again? But Moffat and uh, Gattis aren't that stupid as to play that stunt again. And Piotr puts one foot out gingerly. There, I've done it. No, Piotr put both feet out and then step back in again. And he does gingerly put the other foot out. And as soon as he does, Dracula comes out of the shadows. And it's a great move. And he just goes, Rah! like that. So Piotr jumps back in again and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you've all jumped out your skin. And Dracula just laughs. He goes, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> it is, it's camp, it's salacious, it's silly, it's absurdist. It's also quite subversive. And, um, you know, I love it. I love it. I love what they've done. I love the tricks they pulled. The total inversion of what we know to be legend and lore of the vampire. And it's a clever retelling. The Demeter set is great, the music's good, the effect, it's not as, this one was not as gory as the first one. Uh, although there's a little bit, there's a little bit of stuff in it, but a few neck bitings, but nothing that terrific. Um, but, but, something does go wrong with this. My opinion, my opinion alone. But I do think that after all the, uh, the slavish praise that episode one got, this one, because of what happens at the very end of this one, is going to cause some problems for some people. And it does for me. And But, you know, i got a feeling that they will dig themselves out of this apparent hole. Because, you know, they're clever writers. Moffat and Gattis know what they're doing. Um, but they could not resist the temptation, it seems to me, to go whole hog at the end. Because... Now, folks, obviously, you knew this was going to be a spoiler review coming into this. So, you know, obviously, I've just detailed everything that happened up until the end. And now I'm going to tell you what happens at the end. Sister Abigail blows the fucking ship, or wants to blow the ship up. Because even though they've set fire to the Count, and they've had a big skirmish on the deck, and the Count's gone overboard, totally on fire. You know, and they chucked all the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the caskets of earth over the side as well, but there's one left. So if he comes back, we can trap him in that. That's the idea. And then she realises, hang on a minute, this ship can never get to Whitby. We can't allow... This ship is now contaminated with the vampire taint. We can't allow it to get there. So you guys all take the, the lifeboat 
By the way, half the crew have already left in a lifeboat. So a lot of bloodletting was obviously eluded there. But uh, so they get in this boat. The captain says, no, 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 I'm gonna stay on board. And the captain goes down with his ship. But Dracula is on board as well. I mean, what, not a surprise. Puts the bite on the captain. And then, but he's not dead. And he breathes into like, you know, uh, Abigail. He says, Abigail, keep him talking. Because they've got caskets of gunpowder down there and they're gonna blow a hole in the hull and drop the ship to the bottom of the sea, taking Dracula with it. So she keeps him talking, but Dracula's not a dumbass, you know. And she says to him, how oh, did you escape that before? Have you been swimming for days? Because apparently weeks gone by since he, he went over the side. And he went, oh no, no, I've been here. I just swam under the, the, the ship and climbed up the other side. <laughs> it was not very, not a great plan, but very effective though. <laughs> and then, um, he realises, you're keeping me talking here. And then, kaboom! It does blow up because the captain, with his neck ripped out, still manages to get to the gunpowder and set it alight, and up the ship goes in flames. Dracula, of course, leaps into the hold and looks around in all the flames and we think, what's he gonna do, what's he gonna do? Next thing you know, we see Sister Abigail floating in the cruciform position, highly stylish, of course, and a bit obvious, into the water. Ships going down in splinters and shards of wood. And then the camera will focus upon a casket on the seabed. Hmm, what might be in that casket, folks? Hmm, what might it be indeed, Kiltman? I wonder, could it be Count Dracula? Well, yes, it could. <clears throat> and he punches his way out. A bit like, you know, the bride in um, Kill Bill Volume 2. <laughs> Gets out of the, the casket. And then, like Highlander, when he realizes he can't die and he goes over the side into lock whatever, he then walks ashore to Whitby. Now, all the time that this happened, I kept thinking he's going to stumble across Sister Abigail's body. She's going to be on the air, on the beach. Now, this is where it all goes, potentially tits up. But who knows? We've still got another episode to go. As he slicks his hair back and oh yes, and there is the real. Um, uh, God, Whitby Abbey is up on the cliff top there. You can see that. Oh yes, that looks good. And as he's about to walk up the beach, a huge spotlight illuminates him. <gasps> and we hear the sound of a helicopter. Yes, a helicopter. Looks up, lots of police vehicles converge on him. SMGs are out, armed police. And then obviously a police inspector who looks strikingly like Sister Abigail Van Helsing, steps forward and she goes, Count Dracula, you took your time, didn't you? Oh, so what's happened here? We're now in the modern day. How? Why? Dracula has now turned into that god-awful fucking show, Torchwood. Holy shit. Why did he do that? Why? Now, okay, I'm initially, you know, kind of like, after a great Agatha Christie style horror episode, you then go and turn it into fucking Doctor Who and, oh God, with time travel and all sorts of weird shit going on. And you bring it into the modern world. Why, why, why? But, you know, with the hammer horror sort of bent that the shows had leanings towards, Maybe we're now going to take on board Dracula AD 1972 or even the Satanic Rites of Dracula. These were set in the 1970s where Christopher Lee's count was brought forth into what was then the modern age. And they weren't the greatest films, but they did put a whole new sort of slant on it. They made it, you know, sort of, they were pop horror, you know, and uh, it was clubs and Chelsea and decadence and it kind of works. You know, Dracula would fit into that sort of environment, except Christopher Lee and his fucking cape and all that is a bit hokey. But obviously they showed a little tiny snippet of episode three, which will be tomorrow night. And they'll obviously be covering that as well. And uh, there's obviously a club scene and Dracula's in the back of some kind of limo, modern dress, and he's on the phone. Ah, Lucy Westenra. Lucy, of course. So, they're bringing the last segment of the Dracula saga and they're going to play it out 
modern day. How the fuck this has happened, God only knows. But once again, you know, this is gripping TV and it's left it on another weird cliffhanger. I prefer the previous cliffhanger because that was genuinely exciting. This one is just like, oh what? Now you're either gonna be, oh wow, look what they've done, oh it's in the modern day, oh yeah. Or you're gonna go, oh fuck no. Why, why, why? I do seem to fall into the latter category of, oh fuck no. Why couldn't you have just told? You, you were doing a great tweaked version of Stoker's story, you were. And you gave a great, you know, an entire 90 minutes to the story of the Demeter. Now, some of you out there might know, there was a, I don't think it got made, there was a film supposed to be getting made about the story of the Demeter. And the whole thing was going to be a fictional, well, obviously fictional, but um, an unofficial take on what Stoker had written. It was going to be an entire horror movie set aboard this vessel, this doomed ghost ship, or what becomes a ghost ship. And that sounded great. I don't think it ever got made, because I certainly haven't seen it, and I've heard fuck all about it since I first read about it going into production. So, correct me if I'm wrong, has that been made? I honestly don't know. But, so it was great to get this version, but then they top, topped and tailed it with this, kind of like, oh. You were keeping to the, um, the broad lines of the original story, now you seem to have gone off into fucking TARDIS land. But, you know, this is my initial reaction. Obviously, when I see how this plays out, this could be infinitely better than, you know, my first reactions. So, it could be great. There's a lot of things they could do. They really could, could work some magic into this. And I think, given the club scene and, you know, maybe a bit of modern day decadence and his aristocracy, you know, and his penchant for like wanting to live the high life and learn from all these people and his subversive take on reality, that it will be a, a slant on the two hammer modern day Draculas. It could be, you know, modern day club it, club it kids getting off. It could be like a version of Bla the opening scenes of Blade. Imagine that, that'd be great. But what still wins out is a, uh, Clace Bang, I'm, gonna, I'm probably getting his name wrong, but it's Clace Bang is his name. And, uh, although he doesn't sound remotely Danish at all. And uh, Dolly Watts plays Sister Abigail. Once again, she steals the show. In pretty much every scene she's in, she's really clever. And uh, she fights fire with fire. You know, and she's, she works on the same intellectual level and philosophical level that Dracula does. And the chess game is a great metaphor for what the, it's a bit of a heavy handed metaphor, to be honest, that, you know, they're playing a chess game. And of course, they're mentally playing chess. Now, you're going to get that sort of thing from Gattis and Moffat because they wrote Sherlock, you know, the uh, Benedict Cumberbatch version of Sherlock Holmes. So then that was a modern day revamped, retweaked version and very, very good. It did go out on a bit of a whimper, I'll be honest, but that was an excellent show, very cleverly brought forward in time but adhering to the essence of, you know, Conan Doyle's original characterization and stories. And this, uh, um, does it stay true to Stoker? To a degree, to a degree. You know, the characters are there. Well, you haven't got Van Helsing, you know, Professor Abraham Van Helsing, but you're certainly gonna be getting Mina Western, that's a Mina, Lucy Western, -Rar. so maybe you're gonna get Quincy P. Morris as well, and Dr. Seward. Who knows, you might get these people and they could be like Love Island fucking contestants or something, the way it works out. Maybe they're gonna bring all that in. You're gonna have Instagram, you're gonna have Snapchat, you're gonna have YouTube. It could have all this. So long as it's well written, so long as it's, it's exciting and it still remains clever and witty and with a bit of splashy gore, then it could still work. No reason why it couldn't, no reason why it couldn't. So, you know, Despite my misgivings about the way this is, this is concluded on episode two, and I'm pretty certain I will not be alone in this. In fact, I've already had people messaging me. In fact, they're messaging me now as I'm recording this. Look, it's on my phone. Little messages are coming up, like <laughs> with <laughs> WTF, 50,000 like question marks. <laughs> so I don't think it's gone too 
gone down to a lot of people that I know. But, you know, it is what it is. And what remains to be seen could be fabulous. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Oh, I love his fingers too. You know, he's not hiding the fact that he's got talons. Even when he's, he's all suited up, you know, he, he's whining and dining, well, pretending to whine and dine, and taking someone by the hand and kissing their hand. You know, he's got these horrible, gnarly fucking claws, but he's got the mesmus there. So, you know, and he's got the, you know, the gift of the gab. So he gets away with it every time and he can seduce people. Anyway, folks, it's time for me to split. So, in the meantime and in between time, you guys, take it easy. Stay safe out there. And let's reconvene tomorrow for the conclusion of Dracula 2020. And I'm going to see you all. <gasps>